recording. Hello, saints. Welcome to our channel as sisters in Zion. Our names are KB, Karina, Antonia, and Courtney. And we're excited to share our insights with all of you and welcome you to comment below with what you learned this last week. Feel free to share this video with others as well. We have some online communities that we invite you to join. Links are in the description box. One is on Discord and the other is on Facebook, both with the names the Zion or Bus. I'd like to add that this is supposed to be in addition to your normal studies. This is a, a method that we use to share what we've learned with you, but not in substitution for your learning and um, and for you to share with others. Um, so without further ado, let's get into the scriptures. Today we start out with KB and she'll be giving her um, first insight. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, it says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So number one, my first insight, or I say my sub insight, is I will give you rest, and you shall find rest unto your souls. In the Come Follow Me manual indiv to individuals and family, says, we all carry burdens, some resulting from our own sins and mistakes, some caused by the choices of others, and some that are nobody's fault, but are simply part of life on earth. Regardless of the reasons for our struggles, Jesus pleads with us to come unto him so he can help us bear our burdens and find relief. In Mosiah 24, it states in um, verse 1, and it came to pass that Amulon did gain favor in the eyes of the king of the Lamanites. Therefore, the king of the Lamanites granted unto him and his brethren that they should be appointed teachers over his people. Yea, even over the people who were in the land of Shemlon and in the land of Shimlon, Sh Shilom and in the land of Amulon. For the Lamanites had taken possession of all these lands. Therefore, the king of the Lamanites had appointed kings over all these lands. And now the name of the king of the Lamanites was Laman, being called after the name of his father. And therefore he was called King Laman. And he was king over a numerous people. And he appointed teachers of the brethren of Amulon in every land which was possessed by his people. And thus the language of Nephi began to be taught among all the people, the Lamanites. And they were a people friendly, one with another. Nevertheless, they knew not God. Neither did the brethren of Amulon teach them anything concerning the Lord their God, neither the law of Moses, nor did they teach them the words of Abinadi. But they taught them that they should keep their record and that they might write one to another. And thus the Lamanites began to increase in riches and began to trade one with another and wax great and began to be a cunning and a wise people, as in the wisdom of the world, yea, a very cunning people, delighting in all manner of wickedness and plunder except it were among their own brethren. And now it came to pass that Amulon began to exercise authority over Alma and his brethren and began to persecute him and cause that his children should persecute their children. For Amulon knew Alma, that he had been one of the king's priests, and that it was he that believed the words of Abinadi and was driven out before the king, and therefore he was wroth with him, for he was subject to King Laman. Yet he exercised authority over them and put tasks upon them and put taskmasters over them. And it came to pass that so great were their afflictions that they began to cry mightily to God. And Amulon commanded them that they should stop their cries. And he put guards over them to watch them. And whosoever should be found calling upon God would be, should be put to death. And Alma and his, his people did not raise their voices to the Lord their God, but did pour out their hearts to him and he did know the thoughts of their hearts and it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came to them in their affliction saying lift up your heads and be of good comfort for I know of the covenant which ye have made unto me and I will covenant with my people and deliver them out of bondage 
And I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders that even you cannot feel them upon your backs, even while you are in bondage. And this will I do that ye may stand as witnesses for me hereafter, and that ye may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. And now it came to pass that the burdens which were laid upon Alma and his brethren were made light. Yea, the Lord did strengthen them that they could bear up their burdens with ease, and they did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. And it came to pass that so great was their faith and their patience that the voice of the Lord came unto them again, saying, Be of good comfort, for on the morrow I will deliver you out of bondage. And I'm going to, I put the rest of it, this in here so that it can be read or somebody wants to read further on. But let me tell you my first thought when I read this excerpt about finding, um, no matter, it just sounds like today, right now, in our lives right now, where we have such wickedness around us and we are being held in bondage in a lot of, in, in a metaphor way uh, of things that um, are restricting our, our, our ability to um, do what we know is right to do. And, um, and I, the Lord, if you scroll back up, can you scroll back up? Sorry, right there. Oh, back, back, keep, keep, yeah, right where I highlighted it, bolded it, right here. Lift up your heads and be of good comfort, for I know of the covenant which ye have made unto me. I think of the covenants that we are making in the temple um, for those of us who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in which we covenant with him to obey him and to, to sacrifice um, what we want for him and what he wants and and he will ease our burdens which are put upon our shoulders and those things that we are um, having to buffet with on a daily basis um, we I know for me that my burdens feel so much lighter knowing that my savior is right beside me and knowing that he will stand as a witness for me and be my partner in life. And that he may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, or do visit my people in their afflictions. We know that he does because we have felt that in our lives. So you can go ahead and go down to the next section here and I kind of ad lived that I just felt like I needed to Im impress upon um, how how that we can liken this scripture and this passage to ourselves because we are experiencing that right now and where we are going to need to be delivered in so many different ways. Um, and President Nelson said in Overcome the World and Find Rest, his conference talk in, in 2022, Find rest from the intensity, uncertainty, and anguish of this world by overcoming the world through your covenants with God. What does it mean to overcome the world? It means overcoming the temptation to care more about the things of this world than the things of God. It means trusting the doctrine of Christ more than the philosophies of men. It means delighting in truth, denouncing deception, and becoming humble followers of Christ. It means choosing to refrain from anything that drives the spirit away. It means being willing to give away even our favorite sins. And then further down in the talk, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, I grieve for those who leave the church because they feel membership requires too much of them. They have not yet discovered that making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier. Each person who makes covenants in baptismal fonts and in temples and keeps them has increased access to the power of Jesus Christ, which makes you, which brings you the, the, in the, um, the relief of all of this anxiety that you might have and, and, and releases um, this burden that you might feel otherwise. And it's a real power that lifts and removes those kinds of devastating feelings that we might have. Please ponder that stunning truth. 
The reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power, power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. This power eases our way. Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to his pow higher power. Thus, covenant keepers are entitled to a special kind of rest that comes to them through their covenantal uh, relationship with God. Now, you may be thinking this sounds more like hard spiritual work than rest, but that here is the grand truth. While the world insists that power, possessions, popularity, and pleasures of the flesh bring happiness, they do not. They cannot. What they do produce is nothing but a hollow substitute for the blessed and happy state of those who keep the commandments of God. The truth is that it is much more exhausting to seek happiness where you can never find it. However, when you yoke yourself to Jesus Christ and do the spiritual work required to overcome the world, he and he alone does have the power to lift you above the pull of this world. So my thoughts, there is nothing in this world that Babylon has created that can give anyone this kind of rest. I find rest when I think of Christ redeeming grace on my own behalf i.e. a death of a spouse, death of a son that I've experienced. Knowing families are eternal, I will see and be with those loved ones again. That brings me peace. <clears throat> Beyond description, there are so many heartaches in this life, but through him, all things will work together for our good, and I know that to be true. Thank you, KB. I love your thoughts on this. Um, in fact, that's one of the scriptures that I'll be sharing later in Mosiah 24, that those burdens become light. And I like the picture that you put in here, showing us yoked um, with the Savior here, and that he says that he gives us rest because he's carrying that. It's not, and then what President Nelson says is that you know, that we'll be happier because we have rest because we know that he is there with us. And uh, that doesn't take away the trial, but the sting and the heaviness like the Alma's um, group felt, they felt their burdens were easy to carry. And I can also testify of that, that in the times of my heaviest burdens, my heaviest trials, I can... Uh, withstand the storm because I know he is there um, with me and uh, it makes it, it uh, the, all the difference in the world. I agree with all of that. I was um, impressed when you were talking about our prophet, President Nelson, and about what he has said. And it reminds me of the wholehearted talk by Sister Craig. Um, at the very end, when she says that the President Nelson and his fellow apostles, where they speak, um, she chooses to follow them because where they speak for him, our Savior, and are stewards of the ordinances and covenants that tie me to the Savior. And that's, that's what it is. If we don't keep those covenants or ordinances, then we're not tied to the Savior. And we can't find rest then. Um, and she also says, when I stumble, I will keep getting up, relying on the grace, enabling power of Jesus Christ. And that's us, like, that's your testimony right there. And that's my testimony up in 20 years. I know that's Courtney too. Or Kelly, sorry. <laughs> and yeah, I know that those things are true. That those things yoke us to him, keeping our covenants and following those ordinances completely awesome does anybody have any more commentary right now i just thought of i don't know if y'all remember um those sack races the potato sack races <laughs> and there you always wanted to pick a good partner to be able to jump with you because you know you don't want them to trip you or whatever. And um, not only do we choose the Savior, but he chooses us. And because we do, he, you know, we're winners every time, you know. And I think that's interesting. You you brought up with the, you know, gunny sack. Um, we have to be in step with him. 
um, or it doesn't work. He sets the pace for us. He knows how fast we can go. We need to hear him and follow his lead through that and we'll get through the race. Yeah, the more and more we pray for the things that he wants us to pray for, the more and more we will get receive those blessings just being in step like with that bag race. So the same thing. Yeah. And it'll be smoother. <laughs> yeah. In spite of me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, if no one has any more commentary, um, Karina, you can uh, go with your uh, first insight for this week. Okay, so this one doesn't feel very restful, but it wasn't pointed out in the Come Follow Me manual, but, and the scriptures weren't, I mean, the chapters are, but the scriptures aren't, and it kind of hit me strongly, and I think it's because one time Micah had a whole thing about this, of a whole fireside, I think, about this, and it, like, hit me strongly, and it's not, it doesn't flow quite with your point, um, but I, I think my other point flows a little bit more, but I will start with this one because it might be where it needs to be. Um, so like I said, it wasn't highlighted in the Come Follow Me manual for the individuals and families, but the scriptures are definitely there to read. So I felt like this was a good point to share. Not that those who are doing Come Follow Me need it, but maybe we do. I mean, it's there. We should be reading these scriptures as, as well. Um, just let everyone know, no condemnation from me. I'll just let Jesus Christ and his prophets and apostles do that. <laughs> so let's get into these words. This is from Bruce R. McConkie in the Doctrinal New Testament Commentary, Volume 1. Um, in Matthew 12, 38 through 42, he says, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall, be no, but there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented that at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And then in Luke 11, 16 and 29 through 32, it states, and others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven. And when the people were gathered thick together, they began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign and there is no sign to be given, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was the sign to, unto the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and, con and shall condemn them, for she came to the outmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Um... And so uh, Bruce R. McConkie breaks these down. And so I'm just going to read it. And whoever wants to read and see which part goes with what, that's fine. I'm just going to read what he says. Uh, the quest of the South shall rise up in the day of judgment when the men of the generation and condemn them. For she came to the utmost part of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Oh, this is in Luke. Sorry. This is this more scripture. I'm going to skip the scriptures, actually, and just go to the Luke 16, a sign from the heaven, right there. You can read more of the scriptures if you want. Uh, so, a sign from the heaven. So, they had already seen the signs in such number and variety as had never before in all of history been poured out upon a people. In their streets, houses, synagogues, and lame, the lame leaped, the blind saw, the dumb spoke, paralytic, can't say that word. Paralytics. Paralytics walked and carried their beds, and all manner of diseases were cured. Devils were cast out, the dead were raised, all by the command of him whom they now tempted. Yea, in the face of all of this, they now demanded something new and different from heavily portent, which um, would prove, or which would prove, I'm sorry, that meant to say prove, that what they had already seen was from heaven and not from beneath. Matthew 
um, he, he breaks it down, an evil and adulterous generation. Some sins cannot be separated. This is the part that stuck out and reminded me of that one fireside Michael talked about. They are inseparate, inseparably welded together. There never was a sign seeker who was not an adulterer, just as there never was an adulterer who was also not a who was not also a liar. Once Lucifer gets a firm hold of one human weakness, he also applies his power to kindred weaknesses. This is Joseph Smith. When I was preaching in Philadelphia, the prophet said, a Quaker called out for the sign for a sign. I told him to be still. After the sermon, he again asked for a sign, and I told the congregation, the man was an adulterer, that a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and that the Lord said to me in a revelation that any man who wanted a sign was an adulterous person. It is true, one cried, for I caught him in the very act, which the man afterwards confessed he was, and when he was baptized. So there, the prophet even says it's one and the same. Some do not... Sign, seeking signs and uh, being an, adul an adulterer is they both are together. Jonah's burial in the coming forth of the great fish symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. By repenting and believing Jonah, wicked Nineveh was saved. By repenting and believing Jesus Christ, the wicked Jews could have freed themselves from sin. And the miracle of the resurrection symbolized by the sign of Jonas stands as a witness against them that they rejected their God. And that's Mormon doctrine from Bruce on McConkie. <clears throat> Rise up in the day of judgment. Those who have acted wisely in their day, walking according to the light and truth available to them, shall come before the judgment bar and receive rich rewards, while those who had even greater light and truth offered to them, but who rejected it, shall be condemned in the day of judgment. It shall be as though heathen and Gentile nations, those without the law and the light which Israel had, shall rise up um, in judgment against the, the chosen seed. Those opportunities to do right were far greater. The heathens and Nineveh, of Nineveh repented when the man preached to them. But God's covenant race, God's covenant race, the chosen of the whole earth, refused to repent when the very Son of God came among them. As given in the latter day revelation, the principle of judgment here involved is of him unto whom it is supposed to say is much or much is given, I believe. Much is given, much is required, and he who sins against the greater light shall receive the greater condemnations. That reminds me of um us <laughs> in a way, right there. Are we we are God's chosen people, and what are we doing to follow our Savior, Jesus Christ, or denying him or his prophets? So Alma 30, it reminded me of Korahor. Um, and now Korahor said unto Alma, if thou wilt show me a sign that I may be convinced that there is a God, yea, show unto me that he hath power, and then I will be convinced of thy truths of thy words. And the chapter heading of Alma 30 states that Korahor is the Antichrist, ridicules Christ, the atonement, and the spirit of prophecy. He teaches that there is no God, no fall of man, and no penalty for sin, and no Christ. So there, again, he says, show me signs, but there's no penalty for anything that you do. Um, yeah, so and he was one of the Wicked Antichrist. Um, Doctrine and Covenants student manual states um, for Doctrine and Covenants 63, 1 through 6, listen that you have called yourselves the people of the Lord. So the Lord in his revelations teaches the saints that in order for them to inhabit Zion, they must be a righteous people. The Lord opened his revelation with a solemn reminder that his commandments are not to be taken lightly and that those who ignore them or rebel against them will be punished. The reminder was necessary since many of the early saints claimed to be anxious to build Zion, but were not being obedient to the laws God had revealed. The prophet Joseph Smith also tried to teach the saints the same principle. We know not 
what we shall be called to pass through before Zion is delivered and established. Therefore, we have great need to live near to God and always be strict in obedience or be in strict obedience to all his commandments that we may have conscious void of offense toward God and man. And that's our uh, prophet Joseph Smith. So Doctrine and Covenants also talks about seeking science and he that seeketh science shall see science, but not unto salvation. Uh, for barely I say unto you, there are those among you who seek science, and there have been such even from the very beginning. But behold, faith cometh not by signs, but signs follow those that believe. So if we believe, we will see those signs. We don't need to seek them. Uh, in verse 11, it says that, um, yea, signs come by faith unto mighty works, for without faith no man pleaseth God. And with whom God is angry, he is not well pleased. Wherefore, unto such he showeth no signs, only in wrath and condemnation. And like Korahor, he dies, right? Because he's like, show me a sign. And then he got his sign. He died. Um, in verse 16, and or list, uh, verse 14, it says, They were among you adulterers and adulterers, some of, some of whom have turned away from you and others remain with you and hereafter shall be revealed. Let such beware and repent speedily, lest judgment shall come upon them as a snare and their folly shall be made manifest and their works shall follow them in the eyes of the people. And verily I say unto you, I have said before, he that looketh on a woman to lust after her, if any shall commit adultery in their hearts, they shall not have the spirit, but they shall not deny the faith and shall fear. I just think it's interesting, all of these things, how they coincide, like you do one little thing, show me this, show me that you turn away from the prophets or your bishop or, you know, your stake president or any of these. And because you like, I want to sign. And it just makes me wonder what people are thinking in their head, because even if they think about it, lusting after somebody else, you know, whether it's a man or a woman, it's just, it's not good. Um. I'll go ahead into the Doctrine and Covenant student manual. How is it that signs deepen faith on and the sign see, and the seeking of signs without faith is a sin? Uh, these verses contain a very important statement on the relationship between faith and works and the miraculous powers or signs that accompany faith. The, pro the process of which faith or power is developed is one of testing. The Lord gives certain principles by obedience and by obedience to them, blessings and power follow. But one who has no proof of the promise, of that promise until one acts on the basis of trust or belief, then comes the confirmation of reality of the principle. But only after one acts in faith and trust. That is why James taught that faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Moroni taught the same principle. Um, and uh, so Moroni taught the same principle. We know these things. Um, I'll skip to the Lord will give confirming evidence of all gospel principles if we are willing to act on the basis of faith. Imagine a person who says, before I pay my tithing, I must know for sure that it is a true principle. The Lord's way is just the opposite. He says, first act in faith and pay your tithing, and then I will give you evidence it is a true principle. I, which I find it very interesting because I have someone close to me who's married to someone and he says that he won't pay tithing until he knows that it's a good thing to do. He's not a member of the church yet, but he'll let her pay her tithing, but he won't at all use any of his money and he won't go to church unless he knows that it is true first. And I'm like, well, why don't you just try these things out first and then See if you get the confirmation. I just find it interesting. Let's go to Joseph Smith. The prophet said, I will give you one of the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom. It is an eternal principle that has existed uh, with God. It's a little bit further down. A little further down. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. right there in the middle. Yeah. I will give you one of the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom. It is an eternal principle that has exited with God from all existed with God from all eternity. 
that a man who rises up to condemn others, finding fault with the church, saying that they are out of the way while he is himself is righteous, then know assuredly that that man is on the high road to apostasy. And if he does not repent, will apostatize as God did. The principle is as correct as one that, um, that Jesus put forth saying that he who seeketh a sign is an adulterous person. And that principle is eternal, undeviating, and firm as the pillars of heaven. For whenever you see a man seeking after a sign, you may set it down that he is an adulterous man. Um, yeah, so there you go. They are put together. And um, and that's in what we're studying with Come Follow Me this week. Or if you if people read it, it's not really pointed out. I'll go ahead and skip this quote and people can read it um and go down to uh keep going down let's see oh yeah let's do elder uh Gordon B. Hinckley at this quote um was there ever an adultery without dishonesty in the vernacular the evil is described as cheating and cheating it is for it robs virtue it robs loyalty, it robs sacred promises, it um, robs self-respect, it robs truth. It involves deception. It is personal dishonesty of the worst kind. I think the three brothers talked about that this week, about personal dishonesty. Um, for it becomes a betrayal of the most sacred of human relationships and a denial of covenants and promises entered into before God and man. It is the Validation Sorted. Of, Sorted. of trust. I don't know what that means, though. <laughs> sorted violation. Sorted. Yeah, sorted. Okay. It is a selfish casting aside of the law of God. And like other forms of dishonesty, its fruits are sorrow, bitterness, heartbroken companions, and betrayed children. And that was our, he was once our prophet as well. And his words are true and also an apostle. So here is my plug and invitation to join the Joseph Boys class on Discord. And the first week is class is about honesty and covenants. And if we keep our covenants and if we are honest, we will have rest. It's um, the uh, Joseph Boys is a beautiful study and discussion each week that helps us keep spiritual momentum going with those five invitations that the prophet has given us and um, seriously helps you find rest. So I know that one was a bit extreme, but it like stuck out to me. And it wasn't like one of the ones where you like highlighting what verses to read. It was just like, these are the chapters. And it just was like, boom. Anyway. That's great stuff. I love it. I, I go into this a little bit also, oh, cool. uh, having to do with honesty and um, your thoughts and your words. But I like the part where you say, uh, where the scriptures read already past um, the, 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 the signs follow those that um, are the believers and the signs follow. So if you're seeking for signs and you see a sign, it says that you'll see the signs, but they won't be on to salvation. That means that salvation already passed you by. In yeah. other words, you know, you're, you're too late for the party. Yeah. Karina is so good. I just love um, your thoughts and where you're going. And one thing that stopped, st st stuck out to me was, you know, this, this uh, faith without works is dead. Um, and that is so prevalent right now where there uh, um, those around us or society right now, there are no consequences. Um, and really, um, when you're seeking a sign, are we not avoiding our own accountability, right? Of, of finding out through the source of which all truth comes. And it, it's such a counterfeit that the Satan, Satan uses and takes something so beautiful and sacred and flips the coin and says, you know, turns everything into uh, an excuse for not doing anything, nothing. Nothing. I mean, what is happening in our world right now? There are no consequences. 
Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for the law or for, you know, whatever, I'm not going to get into politics, but um, it is such um, a divisive tactic that Satan has used to turn in the simple truth, which is the foundation, the foundation of all seeking of those who are seeking truth. And that is faith. Yeah. Faith that has to move to action in order for all this to happen. Yeah. And being honest about that. Yeah. Being mm -hmm. Honest that there is a God and a God that knows truth and knows more than we do. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Well, I mean, his tactic is the same as old, and that's the lie, that it's a big lie, and he flowers it up with, you know, and gives it a beautiful scent. But even Korahor, I love that you, you use that story, because even in the end, Korahor had to, you know, he found out the truth, and then he then spent his last few hours or day, day uh, telling the truth. He had to tell the truth. And after he told the truth, he died. Yeah. Yeah. He knew. Yeah, he knew. And I wagered a bet that many other people know too, that it's not okay to make excuses for, for hard work that needs to happen. Yeah, for our there are consequences. In the end, it does say that, you know, the, the end is either life or death. Yeah. You choose yeah. life or death. We all have to be accountable, and if we're not accountable here, it will happen when we go to the other side. It just will. Yeah. All right. Well, that's great discussion. Um, Courtney, you are up. Okay. So that leads me into my discussion about unbelief. And this was literally the only verse for my first insight. Uh, Matthew 13, 58. And he did not many works there because of their unbelief. So this is talking about the savior. And um, I really like this part about Joseph Smith um, because he's talking about a sleeping Christianity. And I would make the case that we have a sleeping group of Latter-day Saints. So it starts, I think that it is high time for a Christian world or for our church to awake out of sleep and cry mightily to that God day and night whose anger we have justly incurred. Are not these things a sufficient stimulant to arouse the faculties and call forth the energies of every man, woman, or child that possesses feelings of sympathy for their fellows or that is in any degree endeared to the budding cause of our glorious Lord. I leave an intelligent community to answer this important question with a confession that this is what has caused me to overlook mine own inability and expose my weakness to a learned world. And I think that's crazy that the prophet Joseph Smith still considered himself to have all of these weaknesses. And it continues, but trusting in that God who said that these things are hid from the wise and prudent and revealed unto babes, I step forth into the field to tell you what the Lord is doing and what you must do to enjoy the smiles of your Savior in these last days. The covenant with Israel, the time has at last arrived when the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has set his hand again the second time to recover the remnants of his people, which have been left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the Isles of the Sea and with them to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles and establish that covenant with them, which was promised when their sins should be taken away. And if you remember from last week when I talked about being sanctified by the Holy Ghost, this is what we're looking for. This covenant has never been established with the house of Israel, nor with the house of Judah, for it requires two parties to make a covenant. 
and those two parties must be agreed or no covenant can be made. Christ, in the days of his flesh, proposed to make a covenant with them, but they rejected him and his proposals. And in consequence thereof, they were broken off and no covenant was made with them at that time. But their unbelief has not rendered the promise of God of none effect. Oh, sorry, hold on just a minute. Somebody's at the door. Uh -uh. Okay, was I off mute that whole time? Nope. You were off, you weren't on mute. Oh no. Ah, could you hear the dog and the door? Yes. <sighs> <sighs> okay. I will keep going. <laughs> Sorry. That's what you get for doing it from a hotel. Okay. The covenant to the Gentiles. Thus, after this chosen family had rejected Christ and his proposals, the heralds of salvation said to them, Lo, we turn into Gentiles. And the Gentiles received the covenant and were grafted in from whence the chosen family were broken off. But the Gentiles, so remember, who is the Book of Mormon written to, right? In the introduction of the Book of Mormon, the Gentiles. Gentiles have not continued in the goodness of God, but have departed from the faith that was once delivered to the saints and have broken the covenant in which their fathers were established and have become high-minded and have not feared. Therefore, but few of them will be gathered with the chosen family, have not the pride high-mindedness and unbelief of the Gentiles provoke the Holy One of Israel to withdraw his Holy Spirit from them and send forth his judgments to scourge them for their wickedness. This is certainly the case. And I would say for us as church members, if we have an unbelief regarding the return of Joseph Smith and New Jerusalem, were falling into that same condemnation. So the next section, um, and I won't read all of this, but it's by Heber C. Kimball. And it says, the words of the Lord to the church, to the prophet Joseph Smith in September, 1832. And your minds in times past have been darkened because of unbelief. And because you have treated lightly the things that you have received. And the next highlighted part, he goes on to talk about um, that they might bring forth meat for their father's kingdom. Otherwise, there remaineth a scourge and a judgment to be poured out upon the children of Zion. For shall the children of the kingdom pollute my holy land? Unless we keep our families in order and instruct our children to be faithful in keeping the commandments of God, not suffering our wives, children to speak lightly of the priesthood of the Almighty and of the holy order of marriage, also known as celestial marriage, which he has revealed for a great purpose. I say, unless we do this, God will visit our families with a scourge. And if they continue their disobedience, they will be removed out of their place, and their names will not be found on the record of the faithful. Um, and then we'll go down to the next highlighted part. This this whole section is really good. 
but I didn't want to read all of it. If our wives wives would remember and keep faithful the covenants, covenant that they have made, they would observe the laws of their husbands and teach their children to honor every law of God and to love, honor, and obey the Lord. If I keep my commandments, I shall be saved in the presence of God. If I violate them, I shall be damned. And so it will be with my family. And what applies to me in this respect will apply to all. So there's a really stern warning about what happens with unbelief. And he, he, Percy Kimball, is also warning us that there will be discourage there will be these things happen i'm going down to the last highlighted part it says may god bless the righteous but the men or women who raise their voices or use their influence against that holy order of plural marriage will be cursed and they will wither away for they have undertaken to fight against god and then he ends with this verse in malachi that talks about the day cometh that the proud, the unbelieving, the wicked, they will burn. And so when I was studying these chapters, it also came out to me um, about unbelief and that that was a key piece. And why is it so devastating to have unbelief? And then reading the prophet Joseph Smith, as he talked about, these are the things that happened. The Gentiles rejected this. Um, I think there's a lot of parallels that we can draw between what um, Joseph Smith said, what Heber C. Kimball said, and kind of where we're at in a church right now. And um, that is my thought with a brief intermission as I opened a door. I want to say, ouch, (laughs) that was like so awesomely cool. If that's even a a, a phrase, Um, I so appreciate you bringing this in. I, that's what I, I said, ouch, because I'm thinking of myself. And one of the quotes there was, um, are you had asked, are we asleep? Uh, Number one and number two Have I treated lightly the things that I have received in the past four or five years since the prophet has pleaded with us how many numerous times to do certain things? Have we been asleep? Are we dozing in and out? Are we in a meditative state? Are we going through the motions? I'm thinking of all the levels that you can kind of go through. Um, are we like, um, you know, hot and cold? Um, are we consistently pressing forward as Elder Bednar has instructed us to do on that, on the covenant path, on the iron rod? I mean, are we pressing forward? Are we clinging? So I, I was thinking of all these things. And, and then the next thing, the third thing I thought of was repent. Um, I think that I do. I mean, there's certain things that I do very, very well. Am I consistent in everything that I've been asked to do? No, I'm far from that. Um, I'm still refining in lots of different areas and will to the end of my life. Um, But wow, there are degrees of unbelief. And where do we lie? And that's Mm -hmm. what the question came to my mind. Yeah. You know, I, I felt that as well. So I recently, you know, went to the temple and as I was pondering a lot of things, um, you know, I actually got a very stern, like murmur, not because of what you haven't seen. And, um, you know, it was really a difficult time uh, for me with kind of some of the things that are going on. But, you know, absolutely at that point, I was asking for things that, you know, probably could have seemed selfish, you know, 
my father's on hospice and he's really struggling with pain. And so I was having that myopic view that Elder Nelson or President Nelson was talking about. So I agree with you. A lot of this was like hitting home for me as well. Absolutely. My thought process was that, um, you know, are, are we treating lightly the things, you know, that have already been given to us? I mean, are we like that person that, um, you know, goes to the movie theater and is seeing a movie and it's just like, oh, this is boring. You know, you want something new and exciting and and that's what's going to get you, um, you know, a stimulated or to stay awake and no, that's not what the father wants from us. He wants us to be consistent. And it's like, you know, those things in life, you know, we, uh, you can't just let your checkbook, you know, run by itself. You have to reconcile it. And it's that consistent, you know, work that you do along the way shows him your devotion and your obedience, not just like, give me a new shiny, you know, something new to, you know, to be looking at you. Those are things that are earned through consistent obedience. And uh, yeah, it's, it, 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 it hammers at home, you know. Yeah, yeah the church is, uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not comfortable, but it does give us comfort. And it, it's interesting how my mother-in-law was talking to one of her sons um, because he's not in the church anymore. She was telling him all of these things that this, this is the gospel. And you need to come back and things and your family and everything. You just, you need to take your place as a patriarch in a family. He goes, it, and he said, oh, thanks for talking to me about this. It's making me very uncomfortable right now. And she goes, good. Because you need some discomfort in your life right now. Everything's too comfortable for you. And it's interesting how we want comfort in our, in our lives. We want the, yeah, the things we want, we want to be entitled to everything. And never, never did Christ ever say, yeah, don't work. You know, faith is works. And what she just said ties in with, well, I don't want any consequences. Well, whether you like it or not, you're going to get consequences that probably you don't want. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, going with your thought there, Karina, about comfort and uncomfortableness, you know, the gospel is not something that's a comfort. And so... I'm already issuing my caveat here. I'm going to issue some very strong words, but they're not my words. They're the scriptures and those that have uh, lived long before me. And uh, so saddle up because it may burn. <laughs> All right. Well, I felt inspired to share in Matthew 12, 36 and 37. And it reads, but I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. All right, strong words, right? The scriptures are strong, and they say that they divide between the, the marrow, right? Well, in a talk by John Taylor, and I want to add also here, that, you know, we're just now celebrating our, our becoming members and, and being sealed in the temple nine years and 10 years being members. And uh, I I'm, I'm feel a privilege to be able to uh, work with uh, such wonderful ladies, but also, you know, um, with the, the spirit that I can go and read and study so much material that I, um, I'll never catch up, obviously, because there are centuries of this, of, of so many talks given. And I try to share some of the talks that just really stand out. And uh, at the same time, during my studies, they, they, they uh, are pertinent to what we're talking about. And their words are way better said than mine could ever possibly be. With that said, John Taylor, in a discourse given in um, uh, entitled um, The Work of God, he talks about this particular scripture. And he says, I speak of this for the purpose of bringing up other things and of presenting them before the people. And the principle I desire to impress upon their minds is that we have no right, any of us, to violate the laws of God. 
The president of a stake has no right to violate these laws. The counselors have no right to do it. The bishops have no right to do it. The priests, the teachers, the deacons have no right to do it. God has called us to stand in holy places and has placed upon us the responsibility of the priesthood. He expects us to be as true to that priesthood and to the administration thereof as the gods are in the eternal worlds. We may think we can do this, this, that, and the other, irrespective of the word of God. But let it be understood that we cannot hide anything from the Lord. The scriptures say, hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? We may succeed in hiding our affairs from men, but it is written that for every word and every secret thought that we shall have to give an account in the day when the accounts have been rendered before the Lord. When hypocrisy and fraud of any kind will not avail us, for by our words and our works we shall be justified, or by them we shall be condemned. It is for us to walk uprightly before God, as it is for the priesthood, the presidents of the stakes, bishops, priests, teachers, deacons, to be governed by the law of God and to see that there is no inequity prevailing in the church. And if there is, it must be dealt with according to the laws of God and not according to the notions and opinions of men. We have no right to condone this and to change the other and to think that we are going to save men by permitting all kinds of iniquity to abound. It is the duty of those in authority to see things straightened out. Matters are sometimes allowed to go on to that extent that hard feelings, division, contention, and strife arise. And all this because teachers, bishops, and others do not do their duty. In our bishops' courts and in our high councils, we must be governed by the law of God and not by our notions and sympathies or anything of that kind, and not because it is somebody's son or somebody's brother or somebody's relative. If I have any sons, brothers, or relatives that they do something wrong, bring them up and adjudge them according to the law of God and do the same with me and everybody else. We sometimes think we will bear with this, that, and the other thing. Perhaps a man can be a drunkard and being a pretty good sort of a fellow, we think we can that we will bear with him. I tell you, he ought to be dealt with accordingly to the, to the law of God. And the same for Sabbath breaking and adultery and other violations of his laws. The saints cannot violate any of the laws of God with impunity, and the officers of the church ought to see that it, they do not do it. You must not be governed by sympathies. My sympathies in the case that I related were very strong, but I must not be governed by, governed by my sympathies. I must be governed by the law of God. And hear me, I put hashtag spar uh, spirometers <laughs> or spirit meters um, or my revelation or, you know, hashtag fallen prophets. Brigham Young also addressed this issue in a journal discourse uh, entitled Confession of Faults. It has been the doctrine of some elders in this church, whence they got it, I do not know, without they got it from the devil, that all the sin you can hide from your brethren and sisters, no matter what nature and magnitude, will not be brought against you in the day of judgment. Such persons are greatly mistaken. For the sins you commit against yourselves and your God, unless repented, of and forgiven, the Lord will hold you, will hold his private counsel and judge you according to the degree of guilt that is upon you. If you sin against others, he will make that public and you will have to hear it. You need not think that you can hide your sins. Confess your secret sins to your God and forsake them and he will forgive them. Confess to your brethren your sins against them and make all right and they will forgive and all will be right. The doctrine of hiding sin is a false doctrine. If such doctrine be true, how will any be brought into judgment? And how is it that their secret words and thoughts and idle words will be brought into judgment? Well, the scripture does tell us as we're studying in this particular one that what you speak, it will be held accounted on, on the day of judgment. Be careful not to have evil words and evil thoughts. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing and asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the hearts. The kingdom of God will increase. Then let every person that desireth truth and righteousness increase in all the wisdom and knowledge they can gather from every source in the heavens and on the earth, from one another, from angels, and also from the wicked. Gather the wisdom they have and treasure it up in good and honest hearts and increase continually. 
and let us righteously guide our own minds and feelings and guide the people in the ways of all righteousness. Take people in every capacity of life and their wills are first and foremost. You can gain and lead the affections of people, but you cannot scare them, nor whip them, nor burn them to do right against their will. The human family will die to gratify their wills. Then learn to rightly direct those wills, and you can direct the influence and the power of the people. Brigham Young also, in continuing in this uh, discourse much later on, says, "And the world is now, and the world is now. So were as the world is now. So were ancient Israel. They were ignorant. They were ignorant of God's righteousness and went about to establish their own righteousness, not by submitting themselves to the righteousness of God." We are too much disposed to believe and act like the world, not rendering that submission and humble obedience to the righteousness of God, which would justly accord to our high profession. Many are disposed through our, their own wickedness to do as I damn please, and they are damned. The volition of creature is free to do good or evil. We are responsible to God for our act as man is responsible to man if he breaks the laws which man enacts. When we boast of our independence to act, it would be well for us to remember that we are bounded by these limits. If we transcend them and violate the, God, the laws of God and man, we shall sooner or later be made to suffer the penalty without any reference to our choice whether we are willing to suffer that penalty or not. Hence, true independence and freedom can only exist in doing right. It is written that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Every item will be recorded, and all will be known when the books are opened. We are acting upon our own responsibility and agency which God has given us. If we secretly violate the laws of righteousness and our wicked works are in the dark while we maintain a pious and fair exterior, they are nevertheless known, and every evil word and work which we commit, unless repented of, we shall be brought into judgment and be made to pay the utmost farthing of the penalty. The Spirit of the Lord is in the hearts of all people to teach them to cleave to good and forsake evil. If they will listen to the whisperings of the Spirit when the gospel of Jesus Christ is presented to them, whether by the voice of his ministers or in the written word, their minds will be enlightened to understand it. Hashtag teach good, forsake evil, repentant heart, knowledge, enlightenment. And then lastly, uh, Milton R. Hunter in a talk in 1946 that is um, not um, titled. He says, Alma was not the only prophet of God who declared we shall be held responsible for every act we commit, every word that we speak and every thought that we think. Jesus, who is the great judge, lawgiver, and savior of the world, proclaimed that we shall be held accountable for the secret thoughts of our hearts. He also declared that every idle word men shall speak, they shall give account of. The savior also maintained that all of our secrets eventually shall be made public. To quote his words exactly, he says, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Wherefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. If it is true that our bad unspoken thoughts are recorded against us, will it not be just as true that all our good thoughts unspoken, the kindness, tenderness, sympathy, pity, love, beauty, and charity that enter the breast and cause the heart to throb with silent good, fine remem remembrance in the presence of God also? Yes, I firmly believe that all our good impulses and thoughts will find remembrance with the Lord just as much as will the evil that we have thought, said, or done. And certainly, since God is our loving Father, he will remember the good with a greater degree of satisfaction and joy than he will the evil. So think pure thoughts. My friends, it will pay high dividends for us to guard our lips, as James, the ancient Christian pop writer, so plainly taught. Any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and also and be also and able also to bridle the whole body. For the tongue which is unbridled is a fire, a world of iniquity. If it pays well to guard our lips, it pays just as well and even better to guard our thoughts. 
for every word that we speak is preceded by the thought. We as the saints of the Most High should accustom ourselves at all times to think such pure thoughts that if our minds and hearts here were laid open before the world, nothing would appear which would which when brought to light would cause us to blush. Since the key to every man is his thoughts, we should thoroughly understand that our habitual thoughts will completely determine our character. For the soul is truly dyed by the thoughts. Therefore, thought and character are one. Our reputation is what men believe us to be, but our character is what God and angels actually know of us. The Lord gave us the key in modern revelation by which we can build lives of righteousness. Let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith, and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God, and the doctrine of the priesthood shall distill upon thy soul as the dews from heaven. The Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion and thy scepter, an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth. And thy dominion shall be an everlasting dominion, and without compulsory means shall it flow unto thee forever and ever. And that's from DNC 121. And then I added uh, this last talk. I love Dolan Oaks because he's so simple and direct. And in this talk in 1986, and reverent and clean, he speaks these words. The words we speak are important. The Savior taught that men will be held accountable for every idle word in the day of judgment. Truly, as the Apostle James taught, the tongue is a fire and unruly evil that can defile the whole body. Profanity also takes its toll as the one who uses it. As we read in Proverbs, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. The spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, testifies of God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. When, who, when those names are dishonored, that spirit which doth not dwell in unholy temples is offended and withdraws. For this reason, those who profane the name of God inevitably relinquish the companionship of his spirit. The Apostle Paul taught in Timothy, in order to be approved unto God, we must shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Profanity leads to more ungodliness because the spirit of the Lord withdraws and the profane are left without guidance. Vulgar and crude expressions are also offensive to the spirit of the Lord. The apostle James taught us to be followers of Christ should be slow to speak, slow to wrath, and should lay apart all filthiness. Filthiness is a term associated with sexual sin and lewd language, as thus we can see in Ezekiel. 16, 24, and Ephesians 5. Paul was surely condemning vulgarity when he wrote to the Colossians, also put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. These biblical com condemnations of vulgarity are needed in our day. Indecent and vulgar expressions pollute the air around us. Relations that are sacred between husband and wife are branded with coarse expressions that degrade what is intimate in marriage and make commonplace what is forbidden outside it. Moral sins that should be unspeakable are more, the, more are in the more common vernacular. Human conduct plunging downward from the merely immodest to the utterly revolting is written on walls and shouted in the streets. 20th century men and women of sensitivity can easily understand how Lot, a fugitive from the actions of, and speech of Sodom and Gomorrah, would have been vexed with the filthy conversations of the wicked. How soberly we must regard the Book of Mormon teachings that there cannot be any unclean thing to enter the kingdom of God, wherefore there must needs be a place of filthiness prepared for that which is filthy. Profane and vulgar expression are public evidence of a speaker's ignorance, inadequacy, or immaturity. A speaker who profanes must be ignorant or indifferent to God's stern command that his name must be treated with reverence and not used in vain. A speaker who mouths profanity and vulgarity to punctuate or emphasize speech confesses inadequacy in his or her own language skills. Properly used modern language requires no artificial boosters. A speaker who employs profanity or vulgarity catch someone's attention with shock effect engages in a babyish device that is inexcusable as juvenile or adult behavior. Such language is morally bankrupt. It also progressively self-defeating since shock diminishes with familiarity 
and the user can only maintain its effect by escalating its successes. Members of the church, young or old, should never allow profane or vulgar words to pass their lips. The language we use projects the image of our hearts, and our hearts should be pure, as the Savior taught. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things, and an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. The Book of Mormon teaches us that when we are brought before the judgment bar of God, our words will condemn us, and our thoughts will also condemn us. There are sins that separate us from God and cripple our spiritual defenses by causing the Holy Ghost to withdraw from us. We should abstain and we should teach our children to abstain from all such expressions. And again, this is not a conviction or a condemnation of anyone. Um, this is, you know, but if the shoe fits, wear it, you know. And um, if there's any of those things that are in your life that you need to remove, I encourage you to read the scriptures for yourself and have the spirit reveal those things which need to be removed from your mind because as they're here they eventually come here and then you are then you know doing that which came from here and uh, we have an expression as hispanics we say um cada cabeza es otro mundo meaning every head is another world and um I can tell you, as I read that uh, from that um, elder, when he said that um, we should be walking as if our if our minds were open and laid bare, that um, would would we blush? Would we want to hide and run and hide because those thoughts would be made um, open for everyone to see and hear? Um, if you do, and um, we are. We need to clean that up. Anyway, so those were my thoughts on those scriptures. That was amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I, I wrote down some new vocabulary that I want to use because they're pretty um, profound. Um, morally bankrupt. I, yeah. It says it all. You're morally <laughs> bankrupt which means you're a very hollow and a hollow, hollow individual in my, my opinion. Um, guard your, and I want to say guard your lips with your babbling lips. <laughs> Bane babbling. Bane yes. babbling. <laughs> um, and you, and, and guard your thoughts. You know, and the thing that comes to mind is, you know, no one will hear me. Yes, they do. God hears this. Angels record this. We must repent of this. This is not something that is, you know, has to do with our integrity. And then the, you know, Joseph's boys, that's one of our, um, you know, honesty is part of integrity, you know, uh, of course. And, and we, we, and, and I uh, advise people to, if you haven't experienced this ex experience of going through um, these courses of discussion that, um, you're 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 going to miss out on some really outstanding um um not ideas of truth uh and uh that will change your life really because you start to search about your own self like for instance this right here has done i mean I'm to talk, I mean, all, I'm, I'm looking at myself and saying how often do i say babbling stupid stuff you know um I mean, I am not someone who, who swears. I'm just not one. I never have. That has not been my, my Achilles heel, but I also say some stuff that's unfiltered, like, oh boy, that might've hurt someone. <laughs> so to me, that's babbling, right? So sometimes I need a little bit of a filter and, and think before I say things. So you, you have my permission. Anytime that I start doing that, you can say, um, Karen, time out. <laughs> Um, but so good, so good. And we cannot hide. And that's one thing that we, we really can't there, there, there are literally, um, ears everywhere on this side of the veil and on the other side. Yeah, we, we can't afford, we can't afford not to, um, to get those things in check because as he says here, by, by, um, by, doing these things, these, these thoughts keep us from having 
the spirit with us. And so we lose out on his guidance. And right now, and we live in perilous times and, you know, we need a constant companionship of his spirit. And so thoughts are one of those things that um, will cause him to leave us. And that's what the Lord, or that's what President Nelson said, right? Get rid of anything that takes away the spirit and um, just anything. And uh, reminds me of a sister in one of my wars back in Virginia saying, once you, once you see it, you can't unsee it mm -hmm. and how it toys with your brain, right? And so we're very careful with what we show our kids and things. But like, you know, more and more, we've been more and more careful since uh, what President Nelson said. Get rid of anything that takes away the spirit we've been even more extreme and people might think we're very zealous or whatever you know extreme fanatics i don't care um <laughs> we want zion that's what we want yes touche cool okay um no commentary uh keep e, you're up yeah, so I, uh, I I put this in part A and B. <laughs> it's the same scripture. I'm take your yoke upon me, and uh, and the other um, part was take uh, by Elder Bednar. Take actually take your yoke upon me, and from Elder Bednar, he um, gave a talk in General Conference in April and said, consider the Lord's uniquely individual invitation to take my yoke upon you making and keeping sacred covenants yokes us to and with the lord jesus christ in essence the savior is beckoning us to rely upon and pull together with him we kind of talked about that earlier even though our best efforts are not equal to and cannot be compared with his as we trust in and pull our load with him during the journey of mortality truly his yoke is easy and his burden is light and I think a burden is light is knowing that we're 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 doing the work necessary to move forward. So in another talk um, in April of 2018, entitled Meek and Lowly of Heart, he says meekness is a defining attribute of the Redeemer and is distinguished by righteous responsiveness, willing, submissive, and strong self-restraint. I don't really remember that talk. But he gave three different examples of scriptures um, and scriptural uh, accounts about having righteous responsiveness and willing submissiveness and strong self-restraint. And so I encourage you to revisit that. Um, my thoughts on, on, on this particular part is the key to taking on his yoke boils down to these covenants. Well, what covenants? Baptism, endowment celestial marriage and where do we find them in the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints why only there if we know god in his gospel he is a god of order his kingdom has order and organization it is plain to see from the beginning adam to present day the authority always has been available through proper administration of the priesthood it was taken from the earth after christ's death and the death of the leaders of the church during the meridian of time it has been restored through the prophet Joseph Smith in our day. For what? So that we can be yoked with Jesus Christ via covenants we make with him. For God said, for behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. For us to realize this promised blessing awaiting for each of us, we must be yoked with Christ to maneuver through the perils of this life, to become righteous responders of callings or opening our mouth when it is called for. We must willingly be submissive to his commands and doctrine and manifest self-restraint from thinking we know it all and don't need him in our life. To have the strength to let God prevail in our lives. So if he is asking me to take his yoke and put it on me, my answer is a resounding yes. This is a no-brainer. Those that do not either don't understand it, don't believe it, or are too lazy to want to achieve it. And the, uh, the next part of this scripture that I wanted to break down was, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Howard W. Hunter said this beautifully. 
this invitation and promise to one of the most oft quoted of all scripture and has been of untold comfort and reassurance to millions. Yet there were those among his hearers that day whose vision was so limit, limited that they could see only a carpenter's son speaking of a wooden yoke, a yoke which from time to time he had undoubtedly hewn and shaped from heavy wooden timbers for the oxen of these same men who were listening. Elder Talmadge, Talmadge added, he invited them from drudgery to pleasant servants, from the well nigh unbearable burdens of ecclesiastical exactions and traditional formalism to the liberty of truly spiritual worship from slavery to freedom, but they would not. Here was a prophetic appeal and magnificent promise to a troubled people facing great peril, but they could not understand it. He knew what lay ahead for them, even if they did not, and he was inviting them to come unto him to find rest and safety for their troubled souls. Had he not already shown them that he could give rest to those who labored with profound illness and disease? Had he not already relieved the burden of those who are, were heavy laden with sin and the cares of the world? Had he not already raised one from the dead, proving that he possessed the divine power to relieve even that greatest of all un un universal burdens, burdens, and yet most would still not come unto him. Unfortunately, a refusal to accept his miracles and his glorious invitation is still seen today. This marvelous offer of assistance extended by the Son of God himself was not restricted to the Galileans of his day. This call to shoulder his easy yoke and accept his light burden is not limited to bygone generations. It was and is a universal appeal to all people, to all cities and nations, to every man, woman, and child everywhere. In our own great times of need, we must need, must not leave unrecognized this unfailing answer to the cares and worries of our world. Here is the promise of personal peace and protection. Here is the power to remit sin in all periods of time. We too must believe that Jesus Christ possesses the power to ease our burdens and lighten our loads. We too must come unto him and there receive rest from our labors. Of course, obligations go with such promises. Take my yoke upon you, he pleads. The biblical times, the yoke was a device of great assistance to those who tilled the field. It allowed the strength of a second animal to be linked and coupled with the effort of a single animal sharing and reducing the heavy labor of the plow or wagon. A burden that was overwhelming or perhaps impossible for one to bear could be equ equitably and comfortably borne by two bound together with a common yoke. This yoke requires a great and earnest effort, but for those who truly are converted, the yoke is easy and the burden becomes light. Why face life's burdens alone, Christ asks, or why face them with temporal support? that will quickly falter. To the heavy laden, it is Christ's yoke. It is the power and peace of standing side by side with a God that will provide the support, balance, and the strength to meet our challenges and endure our tasks here in the hard pan field of mortality. Boy, he says that well. Uh, it just gives me chills. So powerful. So who wants to trudge through life aimlessly and alone? We are promised that he, the Savior, will be by our side every step of the way. I remember as a little girl, there was a children's musical story called Tubby the Tuba. Um, he never thought he was much and always seemed to be alone and ridiculed. He would play his song, Alone am I, me and I together. If I were away from me, me, oh my, oh sigh. And I remember as a little girl, I actually would cry every time. He, he sang that part of the tune, and I, I felt, oh, I could never be alone. That would be so awful, and I am so, so blessed to know with a resounding truth, a resounding conviction of truth that I am not alone. Anyway, he discovers the magic of being a partner with others in making beautiful music together that lifted him to new heights, discovering his true worth. No one wants to be alone. No one. 
To have the ultimate friendship would be to have Jesus Christ by our side always. We are never alone. Even during our loneliest hours, our Savior can be yoked by our sides. And this brought me to this, the lyrics, and I hope I get through this. <clears throat> if the Savior stood beside me, would I do the things I do? Would I think of his commandments and try harder to be true? Would I follow his example? Would I live more righteously if I could see the Savior standing nigh watching over me? If the Savior stood beside me, would I say the things I say? Would my words be true and kind if he were never far away? Would I try to share the gospel? Would I speak more reverently if I could see the Savior standing nigh watching over me? If the Savior stood beside me, would my thoughts be clean and pure? Would his presence give me strength and hope and courage to endure? Would his counsel guide my actions? Would I choose more worthily if I could see the Savior standing nigh watching over me? And this is the part that that is just the clutcher. He is always near me. Not what, what would happen if he were. Though I do not see him there, and because he loves me dearly, I am in his watchful care. So I'll be the kind of person that I know I'd like to be if I could see the Savior standing nigh watching over me. So I'll be the kind of person that I know I'd like to be if I could see the Savior standing nigh watching over me. And the, the next part of the breakdown is, and learn of me, when he talks about taking upon the yoke and learn of me, taking his yoke upon me. And in 3 Nephi 11, 32 to 35, 39, and this is my doctrine, and it is the doctrine which the Father hath given unto me, and I bear record of the Father, and the Father beareth record of me, and the Holy Ghost beareth record of the Father in me, and I bear record that the Father commandeth all men everywhere to repent and believe in me. That is pure doctrine. And so whoso believeth in me and is baptized, the same shall be saved, and they are they who shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's the foundation. And whoso believeth not in me and is not baptized shall be damned. Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine. I bear record of it from the Father. And whoso believeth in me believeth in the Father also. And unto him with the Father bear record of me. And for he will visit him with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine. And whoso believeth upon, a, upon this buildeth upon my rock. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. And in President Nelson's infamous general conference pure truth pure doctrine and pure uh, revelation imagine how quickly the devastating conflicts throughout the world and those in our individual lives would be resolved if we all chose to follow jesus christ and heed his teachings in that spirit i invite you to listen for three things during this conference pure truth the pure doctrine of christ and then he adds, and pure re revelation, drop down to the next one. I'm going to read that because it's it's important. One of the plagues of our day is that too few people know where to turn for truth. I can assure you that what you hear, whoops, keep going, you know, back, back. No, that, yeah, you, yeah, sorry, I'm confusing you. I'm so sorry. Um, um the pure doctrine of Christ is powerful. It changes the life of everyone who understands it and seeks to implement it and in his or her life. The doctrine of Christ helps us find and stay on the covenant path. Staying on that narrow but well-defined path will ultimately qualify us to receive all that God has. Nothing could be worth more than all our Father has. This is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We are his covenant people. The Lord declared that he would hasten his work in its time, and he is doing so at an ever-increasing pace. We are privileged to participate in this holy work. And then he invokes a blessing upon all who are seeking greater light and knowledge and truth and to express his love. So here are my thoughts. My closing thoughts, pure doctrine helps us find, one, the covenant path, two, 
repent and be baptized to begin our journey and qualifying us to receive all that God has and three staying on that path that is well defined yet narrow. So I I had something happen to me yesterday and to me it was such a profound thing and it may not be profound for anyone else but I thought I would share it I jotted down so the thoughts that came into my mind. As I was running Saturday morning, which was yesterday in the beautiful hills in Utah, and yes, cold, crisp air, I was thinking of this concept of a journey, of one finding the covenant path, which will ultimately lead anyone to taking upon us um, the name of Christ, taking his yoke upon us and learning of him. I envisioned an analogy of the erosion process. I know, crazy, right? Um, I envision millions of tiny rocks moving down the slope of a mountain, sometimes at landslide speed, depending on the conditions of the environment. Some rocks are moving aimlessly, others strategically as the path ahead is carved and grooved at a trajectory that seems impossible to follow, but miraculously gravitates in a di different direction that dodges the mountain of stones stampeding directly downward. Most of these rocks um, seem to barrel past and plow into an abrupt spot as large rocks down the bottom of the mountain impede their journey down the rest of the mountain. But there is that tiny, carefully grooved path above that leads to an opening between the boarded wall. While other rocks are literally trapped from a progressing further down the mountain, this small but narrow opening is just wide enough to filter the flow of rocks that purposely follow this grooved path. It funnels down through a gate and allows the rock to become something new during its journey. Though it is buffeted along the way, the rock continues down the path, becoming an entirely different stone, smoothing its jagged <clears throat> edges, changing its color from dullness to a shiny, lustrous hue. The path becomes a safety barrier with protective sides. It serves to protect it from the storms above. The stone is not clinging to the sides for rest and comfort, but the momentum of the journey creates a synergy that fuels desire to reach the end of its journey until finally it comes to a stop and is picked up by the master's hand and counted <clears throat> as one of his jewels. This may be a stretch for an analogy, but this is what came to mind to organize my thoughts. There is a path. It is a covenant path that gives us peace, rest, and hope. We need to find it and stay there so that God can refine us through Christ our Savior. Stay there on that path until we are crowned by him in all his glory. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He loves us and wants to yoke with each of us until that day. We're muted. know if I have time. You're muted, Antonia. I'm sorry. I love that stone. I love the I stone and how it becomes a jewel. That's beautiful. Um, Corinna, I know she's got an appointment. Did you want to um, share your thoughts? I was curious if you could read them just because I have. Sure. Uh, yeah, it'll take Absolutely. about five minutes to get there. Thank you. Thank you, sisters. I'll see you next week. All right. God bless. So Karina's thoughts, um, come and turn to the rest of the Lord from the Doctrinal New Testament Commentary, Volume 1, by Bruce R. McConkie, uh, verses 28 in Matthew. Um, come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I guess this is a growing theme that we're sharing here. Um, then Jesus spake saying, come unto me all that labor and that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. 
This solemn pronouncement by Jesus should be considered from two aspects, the doctrine, the teaching, and the message it contains, and the authoritative manner in which the message is presented. As to the message, it is, call, it is a call to repentance, to forsake the world, to come unto Christ, to believe his gospel, to conform to his teaching, with the sure promise that in such course will be found spiritual rest and peace. As to the mode of expression is chosen, it is the one that in, in its nature affirms the divine status and sonship of Jesus. He did not say, come on to Christ and be perfected in him as Moroni did, nor did, he, nor did her follow Isaiah's pattern. Seek ye the Lord, return unto the Lord, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. His language was not that of a prophet speaking for deity, rather as deity, he was speaking for himself. He did not say, come on to God and find salvation, but instead, Come unto me and find salvation, for I am God, the very Messiah, in whom salvation centers. In breakdown of Matthew 11, 28, though men labor to gain spiritual blessings, they remain laden with sin and never find rest of soul until they come unto Christ and accept him as the Savior. Verse 29, rest unto your soul. Faithful members of the church find perfect peace and rest to their souls. They enter into what is called the rest of the Lord. Attainment of this status includes the gaining of a perfect knowledge of the divinity of the Lord's earthly kingdom. It means entering into the knowledge of the divinity of the Lord's earthly kingdom. It means entering into the knowledge and love of God. By President F. Joseph F. Smith said, having faith in his purpose and in his plan to such an extent that we know we are right and that we are not hunting for something else. We are not disturbed of every wind of doctrine or by the cunning and craftiness of men who lie in wait to deceive. It is rest from the cry that is going forth here and there. Lo, here is Christ. Lo, there is Christ. To those who love God, his commandments are not grievous. In Doctrine and Covenants 8424, but they hardened their hearts and could not endure the, his presence. Therefore, the Lord in his wrath for his anger was kindled against them, for that they should not enter into his rest while in the wilderness which rest is fullness of his glory. Rest is the fullness of his glory. In the student manual, um, chapter 36 on Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord invites us to become like him and the Father. The Lord has revealed that those who inherit celestial glory will receive of God's fullness and of his grace. This fullness is the promise of eternal life, to enter God's presence and to become like the Father and the Son. The Lord explained why he revealed the teachings of John the Baptist regarding him. I give unto you these sayings that you may understand and know how to worship and know what you worship, that you may come unto the Father in my name and in due time receive of his fullness. For if you keep my commandments, you shall receive his fullness and be glorified in me as I am in the Father. On April 7, 1844, the prophet Joseph Smith taught the following saints in Abu. Here, then, is eternal life, to know the only wise and true God, and you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves, by going from one small degree to another, and from a small capacity to a great one, from grace to grace, until you attain the resurrection of the dead, and are able to dwell in everlasting burnings, and to sit in glory, and do those who sit, as do those who sit enthroned in everlasting power. The righteous who have died shall rise again to dwell in everlasting burnings, in immortal glory, not to sorrow, suffer, or die anymore, but they shall be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What is it? To inherit the same power, the same glory, and the same exaltation until you arrive at the station of a God and ascend to the throne of eternal power, the same as those who have gone before. That's from the teachings of the, pro of, of the church from Joseph Smith. And in Doctrine and Covenants, Instructor Guide, it teaches... And section 30 or no, section 93, lesson 37. The glory of God is intelligence or light and truth, a fullness of which can be obtained by mortal man only through obedience to eternal laws. President Nelson has said, quote, I want to know what the laws are. If I can know the laws, then I can get the blessings. Divine law is incontrovertible. Otherwise, you'd be scared to death every time you get in an airplane. Will it fly? Absolutely, because they obey the law. And everyone received the blessing from God because they were obedient to the law that pertained to that area. Our job is to teach people about these eternal laws. They are called commandments. They are, are just as true as the law of lift, the law of gravity, 
the law that governs the heartbeat. It becomes a rather simple formula. If you want to be happy, keep the commandments. In Doctrine and Covenants Student Manual, the, it teaches that all kingdoms have a law given and there is no space in the which there is no kingdom. Thus it is clear that all things in the vast majority, vast immensity of space are under the influence of law. All things are controlled, governed, and upheld by law. Nothing is exempt. Nothing is arbitrary or left to chance. The same in varying result always flows from the same cause. The principles of eternal law are immutable, eternal, everlasting. That's from McConkie, the Mormon doctrine. The truth of this teaching is substantiated both by the revelations of God and by the scientific observations of mortals. As mankind progresses in, in scientific knowledge, it becomes more and more apparent that there is order in the universe and that all things are governed by consistent and harmonious laws. From the atomic realm to the vast immensity of space, there is universal order and consistency. President Brigham Young taught that there is no being in all the eternities but what is governed by law. Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated similarly that Christ governs and is governed by law. God said, for example, that he is bound when his children do what he says. He is bound to fulfill his promises, for he is, being, he is a being of complete integrity who conforms totally to the laws of righteousness. He is a celestial be being and abides by celestial law. For any being who is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. President John Table Taylor said, God is unchangeable, so also are so are also his laws in all their forms and in all their applications. And being himself the essence of law, the giver of law, the sustainer of law, all those laws are eternal in all their operations, in all bodies and all and matter and throughout all space. It would be impossible for him to violate law because in doing so, in so doing, he would strike at his own dignity, power, principle, glory, exaltation, and existence. In summary, all scriptures teach the value of law and the blessings that derive from obedience to it, but especially in the Doctrine and Covenants of the Saints taught the nature, purpose, and not source of law. Knowing that in the last days, law would come under attack from the world, the Lord revealed the benefits of law. He taught that through obedience to his laws, the children are freed from sin, weakness, darkness, and despair. They obtain power over all their enemies and gain power to lay hold of every righteous desire of their hearts. They become free of every encumbrance that holds them back or binds them down, thus having become free and independent and having the ability to live in accordance to all God's laws. The obedient children of God have the powers of the universe at their disposal, disposal to use in obtaining fullness of joy, which will endure forever and ever. How do we enter into the rest of the Lord if the rest is the fullness of his glory? From doctrines of the gospel suit in manual chapter 33 kingdoms of glory and perdition the lord has prescribed requirements for eternal life and is a celestial kingdom one we must receive the testimony of jesus be baptized receive the holy ghost and keep the commandments two we must overcome all things by faith and be sealed by the holy spirit of promise and three we must comply with the new and everlasting covenant of marriage so corinna says so i invite us to awake awake Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, from Isaiah 52, 1. And enter into the rest of the Lord through the fullness of his glory by keeping all of his commandments and fully living our co covenants. I love this part here where she says that, um, that the Lord knowing in the last days would that, uh, the, that the laws would come under attack. And that the Lord revealed the benefits of his law. I love that. Means he's unchanging. You're on mute. You're on mute. There you okay. go. Awake, awake, and put on thy strength, O Zion. I love Isaiah 52, 1. And enter the rest of the Lord through the fullness of his glory. Oh, that's just music to my ears. 
I love that she uh, talked about um, the law and how the law um, that it's through this obedience that we become free. It's kind of one of those um, kind of like the truth will make you free and yeah. you need to work with faith without works is dead, right? So you yeah, it's kind of one of those things that uh, it seems like it contradicts itself in that, you know, that if you obey the laws, you're free. But people would say that laws or requirements or can't, uh, commandments, you know, don't make you free, but um, they are, they are uh, free because you don't have um, the to worry about consequences because you're being obedient. And if there's um, any consequences, they're the ones that the father would hand out much rather than the ones that man would hand. Yeah. You talked about. You're free from unnecessary sin. <laughs> yeah, more likely for sure. Cool, I love that. All right, um, so we have um, Courtney is up. Courtney. All right, I'm ready. So this was another time where I just had one verse. So Luke 11, 3, give us day by day our daily bread. So this is part of the Lord's Prayer. And it led me to Genesis 4, 1 because I wanted to know more about this daily bread. I know we talk about the Savior being the bread of life. And um, I just really wanted to kind of look at a little more closely at that. So Genesis 4, 1. And it came to pass that after I, the Lord God, had driven them out, that Adam began to till the earth and to have dominion over all the beasts of the field and to eat his bread by the sweat of his brow as I, the Lord, had commanded him. And Eve also, his wife, did labor with him. And so, oops, sorry, can you scroll back up? I like that the Lord commanded Adam to eat his bread by the sweat of his brow. And then if you go back up to the chapter in Luke, it says, um, give, us this, give us day by day our daily bread. So we could replace it and say, give us day by day our bread by the sweat of our brows, right? So it's always tying it back to what was the purpose? Why do we need this daily bread? So Brigham Young said, we find a great many saints, we, let me try that again. We find a great many trying to be saints and endeavoring to understand how they may be for the most benefit building up the kingdom of God on earth. My brother Joseph says it's an easy matter to be a saint. So I say, and taking another view of it again, it's a hard matter. This is true. It is not easy thing to serve God and mammon. If the saints comprehend what they have to do in order to establish Zion and go to work with ready hands and willing hearts to accomplish the labor, they will find it a comparatively easy matter, but unless there's unity of action, it is not easily performed. So it is in regards to establishing the kingdom of God in the hearts of the children of men. And if you remember as part of the Lord's prayer, it talks about, um, you know, the kingdom of heaven and um, tying those two pieces together. So it says, it is not very hard matter to prevail on a person to put his treasure where his heart is. So remember, you cannot serve God and mammon. So it has to be um, where your heart is. And he said in the highlighted part, our difficulty is in not understanding the principles of the kingdom of heaven sufficiently to enter it into our whole hearts. So if we think about that, he's saying it's not difficult 
to decide that you want cyan. But what is difficult is understanding the principles and having your heart changed with it. So the part that's bolded, the saints are full to overflowing with the words of eternal life. And I think that's as true today as it was then. So how, do we, you know, take all of these overflowing words that we receive and value them as not, you know, where is our unbelief when we think about we have had an overflowing of the words of eternal life? John 6, 68, yet they do not know what to do with them. And when we come to preach, it seems as though the people were surfeited with much doctrine, persuasion, and counsel, and they did not like it very well. <laughs> and he talks about like the seats that are empty there. Um, and the part that is highlighted at the bottom, if the people were hungry for the words of eternal life and their whole souls even centered on the building up of the kingdom of God, every heart and hand would be ready and willing and the work would move forward mightily and we would advance as we should do. Um, and I think that can apply to all of us as well. Are we hungry for those overflowing words of eternal life? Do we have our whole soul centered on that daily bread that we have been commanded to make? So Howard W. Hunter, what manner of men ought ye to be? Um, he talks about 2000 years ago, a perfect man walked the earth, Jesus Christ. And he talks about him being the standard that we should look to. And in that third paragraph, it says, let us follow the son of God in all ways and all walks of life. Let us make him our exemplar and our guide. So his beloved disciple, John, often said of Christ, we beheld his glory. They observed the savior's perfect life as he worked and taught and prayed. So too ought we to behold his glory in every way we can. We must know Christ better than we know him. We must remember him more often than we remember him. We must serve him more valiantly than we serve him. Then we will drink water springing up unto eternal life and will eat the bread of life. What manner of men and women ought we to be even as he is in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I, I really liked the tie between the offering of the prayer, talking about the daily bread and tying that back into, um, you know, the work and the glory of heavenly father, why we were commanded to have that daily bread. And I think these quotes really helped me to look at what are the things that I have all of this overflowing, you know, knowledge of all of these words of eternal life, you know, am I striving to know Christ better than I know him? Do I remember him more often? Should, you know, am I serving him more valiantly? Because I want to have that daily bread. I want to be there for the kingdom of heaven. And a large part of that is understanding the daily bread and why that matters. And those are my thoughts. That was beautiful. I love every word of that. Um, the waters. I have a question. When, um, then we will drink water springing up unto eternal life. And for me, that I, I, I hear the words blessings um, through revelation. And uh, do you 
what what are your thoughts well i think that christ also like when he introduced himself to the woman at the well talked about how he was the living water and eternal life for me um means that you are in that highest degree of the celestial kingdom so you're living in the presence of heavenly father and christ so that's the definition of eternal life so for me it's drinking up that living water which is christ and then also going through those steps of knowing him you know remembering him serving him and then that leads us down the path of having our calling election made sure which is the eternal life after the final judgment. That, it's awesome. That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, to me, it, um, drinking the water, springing up, um, it, um, to me, it identifies the, the love of God. I think in terms of uh, Lehi's dream, um, the tree of life, which is, you know, um, the love of God and that we would, which is Christ, which is also defined as Christ. And so, uh, being able to drink of him and in, in his glory to, to be in his presence and to, to imagine him, um, teach us and, uh, just to even be, um, in his presence as, as our background is back here, you know, being able to be there, you know, to, to, to be able to be with him and, and uh, feel his love to me, that is, um, that water and, uh, to eat the bread and be able to be, uh, to be nurtured by him through, through him. And so those two things together, um, um, personify, you know, um, our savior. Could we put in that we become like him? Mm -hmm. in there as well yeah absolutely I said, even as he is as it says here even as he is yeah. even as he is so drinking the water helps us become like him achieving Well, this leads me to our last thought here, here about we must know Christ better than we know him. We must remember him more often than we remember him and serve him. Um, I was really impressed to, and I was pondering all week about prayer. And in Luke 11, 1, again, the Lord's Prayer, as, as Courtney was talking about, he says that it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, remember, these these are Jewish men. They they know what prayer is. They know they know how this is to be done. But here they see the Savior and they see um, what he is doing and they want to know to do it the right way. Um, and he says unto them, when you pray, and he tells them how to pray, right? He gives them, you know, the, the, the prayer of the kingdom come and how to forgive. And, um, and then as he finishes giving them the, the, the prayer outline, he then tells them, um, this parable, which is about a friend and how the friend, um, about uh, the bread, and I'm not going to go through that scripture but if you want to go through reading it, uh, but it's from verses, uh, Luke uh, 11, verses 1 through 13. And in the uh, parable of the friend at midnight, which is from that uh, uh, scripture reading, and the student manual, it, it gives us um, this, the Savior's instructions in Luke 11, include a parable sometimes called the parable of the friend at midnight. The friend to whom the host of the traveler goes for bread represents our father in heaven. 
The parable teaches that persistent, righteous, and faithful prayers to our Father open the doors of heaven because of his overwhelming goodness and his love and concern for his children. The Joseph Smith translation adds an introduction to the parable that helps make this clear. Your heavenly Father will not fail to give you unto you whatsoever ye ask of him. Elder James E. Talmadge of the Quorum of the Twelve noted the differences between the friend in this parable and our Heavenly Father. The Lord's lesson was that if a man with all his selfishness and disinclination to give will nevertheless grant what his neighbor with proper purpose asks and continues to ask in spite of objection and temporary refusal, with assured certainty will God grant what is persistently asked in faith with a righteous intent. No parallelism lies between man's selfish refusal and God's wise and beneficent waiting. There must be a consciousness of real need for prayer and real trust in God to make prayer effective. And in mercy, the Father sometimes delays granting that the asking may be more fervent. Now that really stood out to me here. It says that sometimes the Father is merciful and uh, that he delays so that we can ask more fervently. Um, Elder Juan Uceda of the 70 uh, gave a talk in 2016 about um, uh, this, this uh, experience that he had uh, when he was with some missionaries. And he said that uh, in the morning of that same day, he had prayed with his lips and he was about to, when he was about to perish, he prayed from the heart to him. He said, I pondered my life to that point and found that on many occasions, our father in heaven had been so merciful to me. He taught me many lessons that day in Machu Picchu in Cusco, Peru. One of the greatest lessons that I should have always, always pray with a sincere heart and real intent with faith in exercising faith in Christ. So he says, on one occasion, the Lord Jesus Christ was praying in a certain place. And when he sees the disciples ask, teach us to pray, right? And when we pray, when he prayed, he prayed saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. When you pray, do you really truly want that? Not my will, but thine be done. Paul describes how Jesus prayed in the days of his flesh, especially in Gethsemane. He said, when he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him of death, of death and was heard in that he feared. When you pray, are you really praying? Or are you just saying prayers? Are you superficial with your prayers? Jesus prayed intensely and spoke with his father. It came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying the heavens was opened. When you pray, do you feel like heaven is opened? When was the last time you felt that connection with heaven? Jesus prepared himself to make important decisions by praying to his father. He went out into a mountain to pray and he continued to pray all night in prayer to God. And when it was, and when it was day, he called unto him his disciples and of them he chose 12. Do you prepare yourself to make important decisions by praying to your heavenly father? Do you prepare yourself for a moment of prayer? When Jesus came to the American continent, he taught the people to pray. And Jesus said to them, unto them, pray on. Nevertheless, they did not cease to pray. Jesus invites us to pray always. Jesus knows that our Heavenly Father hears and gives what is best for us. Why is that sometimes we don't want to receive? Why? At the very moment we say, Father in heaven, he hears our prayers and is sensitive to us and our needs. And so his eyes and ears are now connected to you. He reads our minds and he feels our hearts. You cannot hide anything from him. Now, the wonderful thing is that he will see you with eyes of love and mercy. Love and mercy that we cannot fully understand. But love and mercy are with him the very moment you say, Father in heaven. So a moment of prayer is a very, very sacred moment. He is not one to say, no, I will not listen to you now because you only come to me when you're in trouble. Only men do that. He is not one to say, oh, you cannot imagine how busy I am now. Only men say that. 
that we all may pray as Jesus has taught us to pray is my hope and prayer, as he says. Now, I looked up the adjective because fervent is an adjective and it's like having or displaying passionate intensity, impassioned, passionate, intense, vehement, ardent, fervent, fervid, hot, burning, glowing, bright. It's also similar uh, adjective, bright, shining, radiant, glimmering, flickering, twi twinkling. Uh, is that a, a description of your prayers, brothers and sisters? In DNC, the Lord tells us, look unto me in every th thought, doubt not, fear not. In Alma 34, it reads, Therefore, may God grant unto you, my brethren, that ye may begin to exercise your faith unto repentance, that ye may begin to call upon his holy name, that he would have mercy upon you. Yea, cry unto him for mercy, for he is mighty to save. Yea, humble yourself and continue in prayer unto him. Cry unto him when you are in your fields. Yea, cry over all your flocks. Cry unto him in your houses. Yea, over all your household, both morning, midday, and evening. Yea, cry unto him against the power of your enemies. Yea, cry unto him against the devil, who is an enemy to all righteousness. Cry unto him over the crops of your fields, that you may prosper in them. Cry over the flocks of your fields, that they may increase. But this is not all, must all. This is not all. You must pour out your souls in your closets and in your secret places and in your wilderness. Yea, and when you do not cry unto the Lord, let your hearts be full drawn out in prayer unto him continually for your welfare and also for the welfare of those who are around you. And in Mosiah 24, as KB read earlier, and it came to pass that so great their afflictions that they began to cry mightily to God. And Amulon commanded they should stop their cries and put guards over them to watch them, that whoever, whosoever should be found calling upon God should be put to death. And Alma and his people did not raise their voices unto the Lord their God, but did pour out their hearts to him, and he did know the thoughts of their hearts. And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came to them in their affliction, saying, Lift up your heads and be of good comfort, for I know the covenant which ye have made unto me, and I will covenant with my people and deliver them out of bondage. And I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders, that even you cannot feel them upon your backs even while you are in bondage. And this I will do, that ye may stand as witnesses for me hereafter, that ye may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. And now it came to pass that the burdens which were laid upon Alma and his brethren were made light. Yea, the Lord did strengthen them, that they could bear their burdens with ease. They did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. And it came to pass that so great was their faith that their patience and their patience that the voice of the Lord came unto them again, saying, Be of good comfort, for on the morrow I will deliver you out of bondage. I complete this with telling you, brothers and sisters, did you think to pray? Air, you left this room, your room this morning. Did you think to pray? In the name of Christ our Savior, did you sue for loving favor as a shield as your shield today? Oh, how praying rests the weary. Prayer will change the night today. So when life gets dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. When your heart was filled with anger, did you think to pray? Did you plead for grace, my brother, that you might forgive another who had crossed your way? When sore trials came upon you, did you think to pray? When your soul was full of sorrow, balm of Gilead did you borrow at the gates of day? Brothers and sisters, in every thought, May they be fervent, and may you cry, 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 for the Lord hears, and he loves us, each and every one of us. And I share my thoughts with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So good. This uh, this uh, story, I, I guess it got cut out with uh, Juan Uceda, which uh, I don't know if y'all remember this uh, general conference when he we shared this story that he um, 
they were on this path that uh, was very narrow or he had, they prayed about going to see Machu Picchu and the, the missionaries were very insistent for him to go and he felt like prompted that he shouldn't go, but they kept insisting to go and he, he relented and went in spite of what he had received promptings to. And they were uh, crossing this bridge and um, there was a narrow pass at one point. And as they were um, going, the other missionaries kept getting ahead and they were very far ahead and he was trying to catch up to them. And as they got to this narrow area, there was this one missionary that was, there was, you could only pass one person at a time. And this one missionary was just there waiting. And um, he asked, um, uh, he told him to just go on by. And he, as he was there, he says, what, why was he there? And he said that he felt very strongly that he needed to, to wait there for a moment, that he needed to wait. And so this, this uh, elder uh, stayed there. And then the, the uh, brother Uceda uh, passed him and kept walking. And as he got a little further down the path, he stepped on what he believed was solid ground. It wasn't, and he fell, and he was hanging by branches that were, were going to hold him up. And then just as he was about to fall, uh, he prayed in his heart in that moment and prayed with a sincere heart with real intent. And, um, and at that moment, uh, that elder that had stayed behind walked up and reached forth and gave him his hand and lifted him up. And uh, that's why he said that he had been, um, and that morning he had been praying with his lips, but when he was about to perish, that's when the moment when he prayed, you know, with real intent from his heart. And so that's why he said that was one of his greatest lessons is that he should always pray with a sincere heart, with real intent. That reminds me of my favorite Book of Mormon story ever, which is Enos. And I did fast and pray mightily to know of a surety. And then his sins were wiped away. I love that. Yeah, we always talk about prayer and just we just need to pray and um I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting an, I, I've been studying a lot because it's in my, I, I've been, I've been actually um, studying my patriarchal blessing. I, I felt prompted to, to do that. And I've been studying it and there's a big section in there about prayer. And I think I've mentioned it before that there's a section in there that says very much like here, like Alma, that, um, that they weren't able to pray uh, out loud and um, it actually says that that will happen uh, sometime in my in my lifetime that I'm not going to be able to kneel and pray vocally, but to pray. And um, it instructs me that I need to learn how to fast and pray. That it would be very important for me to to do this. So I, I've been studying it, uh, and there's just so much to learn about prayer. And it's not just like a lot we've been taught is you just sit and have conversation like we have here. But um, we look at the example of the savior as, as the example he uses that when he was in Gethsemane or whenever he, he was with the, with the Nephites, when he came uh, to the Americas, you know, um, he instructs them to pray and they, and they, and they pray. And some of the things that they uttered, well, he told them what they needed to pray and then for them to continue to pray. But, a lot of times we 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 pray as we um, for the things that we want or we need, but a lot of times we need to be instructed because we don't always know what we need, and and uh, especially for you know not even five minutes down the line, we don't know the harm that could be in our way or or the blessing that's waiting for us and. Um, or uh, the person that we need to serve in, you know, five minutes from now. And, and so our prayers need to be just like he says, more fervent because with, with a sincere heart and real intent, you know, Lord, it be thy, my, thy will, not mine, you know, let me see here and do those things and, and recognize them and, and, um, 
And so I want to have fervent prayers, fervent prayers that um, that identify this, that they're impassioned and passionate, intense and ardent and burning and glowing. You know, it's just I think of um, the stones that um, that the brother Joe had, that they were glowing to that degree. They were that ardent or that fervent. Um, I know that we can get pretty passionate about uh, some of our prayers when it comes to loved ones or when there's a need, but they should be truly every day because you know we're 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 in survival mode here. <laughs> yeah, it made me think of uh, you know it's it, prayer is a reflection of our desire and the humility to let him prevail in our lives, and and it it is the key. developing a relationship with him behooves all of us to want to get better at that. Well if the if the if the apostles asked him and they were there with him hearing him and seeing him and they still wanted instruction, how much more should we? All right, well, we are done with another installation of uh, the Sisters of Zion. Uh, we thank you for your comments and your input. Uh, again, um, you can add your comments below and we encourage you to follow the links attached to uh, the groups that we have online and join our community of saints who are Zion or bust. And uh, we love you guys. And until the next episode, we will see you then. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Bye.